Welcome back. We've learned how to identify important words in text by using techniques of pre-processing and removing stop words and looking at word frequencies. In this video, we look at relationships between words and different NLP tools that explore these relationships. The first tool we look at is WordNet. I'm here on the site, wordnet.princeton.edu. WordNet is a lexical database of English nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. WordNet organizes these words into a hierarchy of sinsets. A sinset is a synonym set. Let's take a look here in the browser. Let's look for the word educate. And we see that there are three sinsets. These S's are a link to the sinset. So each sinset can give you a completely different meaning or it can give you a slightly different meaning. What we see in the parentheses is the definition for each of these slightly different meanings. And then what we see in italics are examples of how the word is used in a sentence. The definition, by the way, in WordNet terminology is called a gloss. The part of speech here is in red. For each meaning, we've got some related words. Let's look at civilize. Notice that points back to educate, and it has two different verb meanings. If we click on the S here for this first meaning of educate, we get some additional information. I'm sure everyone's familiar with the term synonym, meaning words that have similar meaning, and antonym, words that have opposite meaning. WordNet includes some things you may not have heard before. A hypernym is a higher level sinset in this hierarchy. For example, canine is a hypernym of dog. A hyponym is a lower level in the hierarchy. Dog is a hyponym of canine. Here we see a hypernym above educate is to make better. This meaning of educate doesn't have a hyponym. It does have a troponym. A troponym is a more specific word. For example, whisper is a troponym of talk. So a more specific meaning would be to groom or train. Let's look at another word, wheel. It has several noun sinsets and a few verb sinsets. Looking at this first meaning, like the wheel on your car, we see a couple of new terms, marinim and holonym. Marinim is part of. We see the parts of a wheel here, and the holonym is a wheeled vehicle. So wheeled vehicle is a holonym of wheel. As you can see, a lot of work has gone into WordNet. George Miller at Princeton started the project in the mid-1980s in the Department of Psychology. He was interested in how our minds organize related concepts in a mental hierarchy. Today the project is maintained by researchers in the computer science department at Princeton. A key difference in human intelligence and artificial intelligence is this type of real-world knowledge that we develop throughout our lives. All of us know that an elephant, for example, is a mammal, and a mammal is an animal, and so forth. Virtual assistants like Siri or Google can retrieve the fact that an elephant is a mammal and then retrieve another fact that a mammal is an animal, but it doesn't have any conceptual understanding, big picture, real world understanding of these concepts. Resources like WordNet can help fill in the knowledge gaps of NLP systems. NLTK provides an interface to WordNet and let's see how to use WordNet and access those sinsets. These notebooks we're going to look at are in the GitHub and much of the code is in the chapter as well. The first thing we do is import WordNet as WN from the NLTK corpus. And then let's look at how to access the sinsets of a word. Let's look at exercise. Notice it returned a list of sinsets 
each specific sin set has this form where we have a word, dot, part of speech, dot, and then a numbering system. For a given sin set, here I'm accessing specifically this sin set right here. You can access things like definition, examples, and lemmas. Here I've retrieved the definition of the first sin set of exercise as a noun. And here I've retrieved the definition of the first sin set of exercise as a verb. Here are some examples. These are generally phrases, sometimes complete sentences. And here are the lemmas. Instead of retrieving all of the sin sets, you can narrow it down to just certain ones with parts of speech. So here I'm saying retrieve all of the sin sets for exercise that are verbs. So this exercise sin sets will be a list of sin sets. And then I iterate over those extracting the lemmas, and then outputting the name, the definition, and the lemmas here. There's a mor morphy function built into WordNet, which will transform morphologically one form of a word into another. So here I'm taking the word friendlier, and I'm requesting the adjective form, friendly. If you don't specify, you just get basically the lemma. Here I want the verb form of wounded, which is wound. And I found this function to be very useful in natural language generation. There aren't a whole lot of antonyms in WordNet. And if there isn't one, WordNet just returns null. Here we get the first sin set by indexing into all of the sin sets and just get the first one and I called it friendly. So this is a sin set. I get the lemmas and here I'm getting an antonym, unfriendly. In notebook 7.2 we look at the WordNet hierarchy and how to extract things like hypernyms, holonyms, and so forth. So first I imported WordNet again. Then using this specific sin set of dog as a noun, the first one, I request the hypernyms. So a dog is a canine and domestic animal. Requesting root hypernym goes all the way up the hierarchy. So a dog is an entity, a dog is a thing. Here I'm requesting the lowest common hypernym of dog and cat, which is carnivore. In this code chunk, I've extracted all of the sin sets here that are nouns, and then just printed out the first 10. And this gives us a sense of the higher levels of the noun hierarchy, where entities can be physical entities or abstractions. Let's walk up that hierarchy for dog. So first I let hype be the hypernym of the first hypernym of dog. And I know that the top level is this entity. So as long as there is a hypernym, in other words, as long as something is retrieved, we're going to print it out and we'll break when we get to the top. So walking up from dog, we go to canine, is a carnivore, placental, mammal, vertebrate, and so forth, all the way up to an organism, living thing, whole object, physical entity, and then entity. This is another way to do the code that we just looked at. First we create a lambda function to get the hypernym, and then we do a closure. This closure method is defined in NLTK, and I have a link in the notebook if you want to dig more into that. It's pretty interesting. And we get the same output. Now we can apply this closure method to the verb sin set of dog. So dog is to pursue and travel. Using the WordNet hierarchy can be a way to inject some real-world knowledge into an NLP system. 
For example, a dialogue agent that wants to say something about a dog could know that a dog is a domestic animal. In this notebook, we look at using WordNet to determine word similarity. How similar is dog to cat? Using a path similarity built into WordNet, we get a metric of 0.2. The similarity will range from 0 to 1, 0 being not at all alike, and 1 to virtually identical. This seems a little low for dog and cat. Let's look a hit and a slap. Again, not terribly similar. Same for hit and a strike. An improvement to the built-in WordNet algorithm is the Wu Palmer similarity metric. And it seems to give us a little bit better results. It makes dog and cat more similar and hit and slap a bit more similar as well. We've talked before about polysemous words, a word that has many meanings. Bank is such a word. We see that bank has quite a few sin sets. So if our NLP application encounters the word bank, how can it know which of these meanings we're talking about? One way is to use an implementation of the LESC algorithm that is here in the word sense disambiguation part of NLTK. Word sense disambiguation is an important NLP task. The LESC algorithm checks for which of these meanings will have the most overlapping words with the word in context of its surrounding text. Let's look at some examples. So in this sentence, I went to the bank to deposit money. Notice I already tokenize it, but you could do plain text tokenize into cent. I want to know which of these possible meanings is probably most likely and it selected to the savings bank. You can specify the part of speech, which will probably help it, but we can see in this case it didn't need that extra hint. Let's look at the senses of able. Able here has four sin sets. Which of these possible meanings matches able in this sentence? You should be able to pass the next quiz. It says two which having skills and qualifications to do things well. There are many, many approaches to word sense disambiguation. The LESC algorithm is one of the earliest. This notebook demonstrates an extension to WordNet called Sinti WordNet, and you can read more about it here at this link. Sent to WordNet scores each sin set on three different metrics, one for positive, one for negative, and one for objective. And those three metrics for each sin set will sum up to one. Here we're importing Sent to WordNet. There's a how-to link in the NLTK documentation. If you wanted the scores for a sin set, for example, here I've chosen a specific sin set for breakdown. You get the Sinti sin set for that, and then from that you can extract the positive score, negative score, and objective score. And so that we see that breakdown is more negative than positive. Here I'm extracting the sin sets for slow, any part of speech, making a list out of those, and then printing their scores. It's better usually if you can to restrict it to a certain part of speech. A for adjective, R for adverb, N for noun, V for verb. You can also extract polarity from raw text tokens. First I make a list of all of the sin sets for pain. Then I select the first one and print its scores. Here I've got some raw text. That was the worst movie ever. And I'm just naively going through each token and summing its positive and negative scores. This is a very naive approach and generally won't get great results for sentiment analysis. A better approach would be to use these scores along with other features in a machine learning approach, and we'll get to that later in the series. Another tool besides Sinti WordNet is Vader, Valence Aware Dictionary and Sentiment Reasoner. It's a rules-based approach. 
that does particularly well in social media like tweets. It's open source and I have a link here to their code. You can install it like this, import it like this. Here's some sample sentences, including some emojis. This is a list of their examples and notice that it will tune into things like all caps, punctuation, uh, it's attuned to negation. Let's see how it works. First we create an analyzer object from the sentiment intensity analyzer and then we're going to iterate through all of those sentences there and print out their polarity scores as a string. These compound scores will be in the range negative 1 to positive 1 and then the neg, neutral, and positive individual scores or ratios for the proportion of text in each category and these will sum to 1. Let's look at that on some text. In their GitHub they have a folder with several different texts that you could use. I'm using one here for movie reviews so I'll read that in and do a split lines and then apply the analyzer to the text in each line. This will give you much better results than the naive approach I demonstrated in the previous notebook for just using Cinti WordNet. This is much more sophisticated. It also has an implementation in NLTK, which you can look at in their documentation. Up to this point, we've been primarily looking at words in isolation. However, words can combine to form a meaning that is more than the sum of the individual words. A key indication that two words do form a collocation is that you cannot substitute synonyms. For example, we wouldn't replace strong in strong T with the word powerful. Collocation algorithms first extract bigrams, which are sets of words that occur next to each other, then search for bigrams that occur together more than chance would indicate. You can think of a bigram as just a sliding window over text looking at two words at a time. So in this collocations notebook, first I imported NLTK and the text objects. And using the Monty Python and Holy Grail text object, I'm looking for collocations. We see Black Knight, Clop Clop, Holy Grail, so it seems to do a pretty good job. One way to find collocations in text is to use a metric called pointwise mutual information, PMI, with the log of this formula. So for two words X and Y that occur next to each other, what's the probability of finding these two words next to each other? And then we divide that by the individual probabilities of those words. And probability of a word is just a scaled count of the word. Here I'm extracting the text of Monty Python. And then here's some Python steps I went through to implement this formula. And I get the pointwise mutual information of Holy Grail is 5.6. A PMI value of 0 means that they're independent. If the PMI is positive, it means that X and Y occur together more than expected by chance. So the higher the number, the more likely this is a collocation. And Holy Grail was identified as a collocation by NLTK. The PMI can be negative, which means it's likely not a collocation. Just because two words tend to appear next to each other doesn't mean they're a collocation. So consider of and the. These are going to occur together very often because they're stop words and often are the first part of a prepositional phrase. But doing the pointwise mutual information, we see that it's fairly close to zero. So I hope this video has given you a sense of the kinds of things you can do with WordNet and other NLP tools. So you can kind of tuck this away in the back of your mind for use cases you discover in your own projects. Today I'll leave you with a quote from Emily Dickinson. A word is dead when it is said, some say. I say it just begins to live that day. Mm -hmm.